Oh, so before we start, um, there's, there's a visitor in the room. Dr. Derenz is sitting uh, right there. I think he's just raised his hand. He's, he's going to take over from me uh, week after next. Um, um, I'm guessing you're going to go over uh, ooh, uh, binary search and all those things and you know f uh, file I.O. Um, and all those cool things. And, uh, OK. So, just, there's a show of you today. People are, I mean, we're churning out of people there. Um, I, I, sp I spoke to a number of people yesterday after class, and I realized that, uh, and certainly the, the sample wasn't representative enough, but I, I kind of got the sense that not everybody got what it is we spoke about yesterday. Well, not everything, but most, most, most of the people I spoke to yesterday seemed lost. And so I figured maybe we could you know, tweak the approach slightly and maybe just go over some of the things that we did yesterday, uh, if it's OK with you. Could, could, I, could, could we have a show of hands of people who, who understood everything we spoke about yesterday? I know I did, because I was doing it. <laughs> OK, fine. Um, so we'll probably spend the first half of the class you know, quickly redoing what we did yesterday, and hopefully that should help. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. I've, I've decided to uh, not switch context and go to wing. It appears people get confused when I do that, so we'll do this now. OK. Um, so quickly, I, just, I, I figured we'd start off by a very simple example, right? A very, co a very simple code snippet. Uh, so if you look at the, if, if you look at the code on the left-hand side here, this is, this is what we had been doing prior to yesterday's class, right? Um, and I'm specifically making reference to line number four there, right? Whenever we define functions, we there was there was never a point when we actually use the return statement. But what we'd otherwise do is, at the end of it, or would print out whatever it is we're interested in. In this case, it's line number four, right? But what we discovered yesterday, right, and this is very important, what we discovered yesterday is that what we had in actual fact been doing is implementing functionality that did no more than just print out output. And that's not very useful, especially when we you know, begin to implement uh, functions that would otherwise need to use an input to other functions, right? And so we introduced line number four on the right-hand side, the return statement, right? And what we said about the return statement is what it does is, as opposed to um, you know, uh, explicitly telling Python to say, we just want you to print out uh, a particular output, what the return statement does is it returns a specific data type, a value, right? So if, if if we were to run these two you know, code snippets, um, obviously the, the logical thing to do, seeing as we are um, implementing functions here, is we'd, we'd need to probably assign it to a variable, right, which would later on reuse, right? But an interesting thing is if we printed out y, the, the y corresponding to the left code snippet, what would happen is would would actually get nothing. Well, pretty much get a none, right? But th there wouldn't be any kind of like uh, valuable output coming out from that. Is this making sense? Another interesting thing is if we, if we use the type function, remember the type function? It's one of the built-in functions, Python function, functions. If we, if, we, if we run type on our variable y here, this is the output that we get. So Python tells us to say this is a none type, right? It's, 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 not, it's not necessarily a very useful data type. You can't do anything with it, right? But things start getting interesting on the right-hand side because when we assign the variable y to this function which returns this thing that we are interested in, the final output here, avg, if, if we print out y, it will actually print out the value that we want it to return, right? In this case, remember, we're evoking uh, fx add with variables 10, 10, right? So we're trying to compute the average of 10 and 10, which should be 10, right? And 
again, if we run, again, if we rerun, uh, or if we evoke the type function by feeding it the y output of the code snippet on the right hand side, what we get is a float. And it makes sense, right? Because whenever we use the, remember the, the forward, slash back, forward slash, when we're dividing integer values, what, what is the result? But we know this, right? We looked at operators. What, what happens when we have two integers and we divide? Yeah, it's a float, right? So that's why we have class float here as the result of uh, running type against y. Is this making sense so far? Thank you. Uh, there's more coming here, right? What, what, we also, what we also mentioned yesterday was, was that the, well, by, by, and I think this is syntactic, right? So the Python syntax only allows us to return a single value with a return statement, right? But we also realize that what we could do in the event that we wanted to return more than one value, uh, I mean, I would, I would obviously be surprised if someone could think of um, an implementation that would you know, require them or require them to return more than one value. But if it so happens that you want to do that, you can separate um, the many, uh, is it outputs that you want Python, the Python function to return by commas, right? But what Python does behind the scenes is it doesn't return those different values um, separately. What it does is it internally converts your output into a tuple, right? And so what happens when you evoke the return statement with more than one return value by separating them with commas here, Pay attention to line number four. It's in board, deliberately here. Um, what happens is Python internally converts the output into a tuple. And we'll get to learn about tuples and sets and you know, dictionaries and lists uh, next week, actually. But for now, what, what, what we should know is that a tuple is um, basically a data type that uh, organizes information within our, our parentheses, and it separates you know, the elements within the tuple with a comma, all right? So much says that if, if we assigned a variable y, and again, y could be anything, it could be x, a, b, c, nobody cares, right? It could be results, actually. But if, if we assign y to the, to the result of evoking this function, fx, a, b, g, what will happen is it will return this, right, if we print out y. Because we told Python one to return two values, but but syntactically, Python will only return a single value when you run a return statement against a value, right, or values, right? So we have a tuple there. And you could check it by um, evoking the built-in type function against this variable y, and you get a class of type tuple. Are we together? Okay. We, we, we also touched on, so we, initially when we started looking at functions, we, we, we pretty much looked at uh, this, this whole notion of, of, of us trying to you know, avoid duplication when it comes to uh, you know, um, I implementing code constructs such as functions, right? Um, and, and what this slide does is it, it actually gives us, it actually gives us a, a very classic example of what we've been doing, right? So if we look at the, the code snippet on the left-hand side here. Uh, we are doing the obvious things. We have done this. Everybody knows what we're doing here. We, we've implemented a function that takes in uh, ah, a variable list of what? Positional parameters, remember? The, the implications are quite, I mean, this is serious here because what this function does is, we, we remember we, we looked at examples similar to this. We can feed it as many uh, arguments as we could possibly want, right? Mm, although we should mention here that Python actually has a limit, uh, and uh, it has a limit on, 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 on how many arguments it can take, by the way. Um, and I, I think last time I checked it was 255, so you can't go beyond that, right? You can try it out uh, at your own time if you want to. Do you want us to look at it right now? Do you? 
Is that fine? Are you, are you comfortable with the fact that it's 255? You don't have, you can go and verify it on your own if you want to. Right? So, uh, the code snippet on the left hand side is doing something very basic. It takes in a variable number of parameters, right? Oh. And then we, we, are, we are looping through, we, we don't know how many, we don't know beforehand how many parameters we're going to, to evoke our function with. It could be five parameters or 10 parameters, right? And so what we want to do for us to get the sum of, of those parameters, we're assuming these are numbers here, right? For us to get the sum of those parameters, what we're doing is we are looping um, a potential future uh, argument that would feed it, or arguments that would, would feed it one at a time, right? Excuse me. And as we, as we look through it, um, we actually add it to, to the variable sum that we've created in line number two here. This is straightforward, right? We, we are adding it successively, right? And then afterwards, once we are done looping, we return sum, right? So it's going to return, you know, uh, like if, if you evoke it in line number seven, it's going to return one plus two plus three, which is six, <clears throat> right? But, but what, if, what if we wanted to do something else, right, with an, an arbitrary number of, let's say, parameters, right? What if, what, what if we wanted to compute the average, right? Obviously, the normal thing for us to do, seeing as we're looking at functions, is we implement a function that would do that, and it pretty, much does, it pretty much does something similar, with the exception that we know that for us to compute the average, we need to sum um, the, 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 the different numbers that we want to compute the average for and then count the number of, you know, the, the number of numbers. And then we'll divide the sum by the count, right, to get the average, right? So this is what we're doing. But notice in line number four and five, Line number four and five is almost exactly this. In fact, it's exactly the same as line number three and four. So what we're saying is, if we have already, if we already have an implementation on the left-hand side, you know, why, why, can we not, why can we not avoid rewriting line number four and five? And the thing is, in real life, it's not really like you're going to be rewriting uh, two lines of code, right? I mean, it could be, but when you actually start doing these things, uh, I don't know at what level you're going to start doing this. Uh, most of you are engineers in here, probably third, fourth year. I mean, you'll be writing you know, a number of, like, to, to be many lines of code, not just five and seven or three lines of code, right? So what we're saying is, why, why can't we reuse the, the code on the left-hand side and insert it in between line number four and five? Because we've already done it, why should we redo it, right? We are duplicating effort here. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was a question. Someone's pointing at the board. So why, why don't we do what, what I'm doing on this slide here, right? Why can't we just, instead of redoing three and four, why can't we just evoke the function fx add? Reuse it, right? It's there. Why, why not reuse it, right? And how do we reuse it? We know that we can only reuse, the, the way that we reuse the function is, obviously we want to reuse the output, so we need to evoke the function, and we need to assign the result that's going to come out of the evocation process to a variable, right? And then we'll subsequently use that variable in our computation. And this is what we're doing in line number two. So in line number two, we are evoking the fx add function. The implementation is on the left-hand side, right? We are assigning the, um, the result of this function uh, to the variable sum. And, and, and notice again what we are, the, the way we are invoking this function. The, the lady who normally sits somewhere there, uh, she, she, she's not here today. But she, 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 she actually, she's the one who reminded, who reminded us that there's an easier way of actually um, unpacking these, these, these potential sequences that would feed uh, a function that takes in a variable list of parameters, right? I know that during the invocation process, we must precede whatever sequence of, uh, well, whatever uh, value that has a sequence with a what with an asterisk. Is it? Do you remember this? All right. And then I mean, we, we do the, the, the obvious stuff like uh, computing the count and then uh, finally uh, assign the, var the variable AVG to the result of dividing the sum by the count. <laughs> oh, 
Sorry, I... <laughs> I, I missed the joke, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm probably not following here. But, but, but of course, I missed it, literally. I'll have to watch the video, right, to try and figure out what, what happened here. Uh, but, 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 but of course, uh, uh, a typo here, obviously, the way that we would, we would not evoke, we, we certainly would not evoke the, the code snippet on the left-hand side with dot, 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 no. We know this, right? This is just dot, dot, dot just means you can feed it anything. This is just missing dot, dot, dot. And we certainly would not uh, evoke this. Well, we could evoke this function without any parameters. Could, could oh, yes? Sorry? Why am I? Oh, it should be AVG. Thank you for that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, another typo here. This should be AVG. And of course, we wouldn't run AVG without any. But we wouldn't run AVG without any parameters. By the way, this uh, aha. Do, do you think? Uh, let's not ask questions here. People don't like questions. Yeah. Function that generates the list of the function. Yeah, and, and the, the nice uh, the, the nice young Sai here who's uh, using his phone right now. He this is this is what I'd asked yesterday. I, I, I figured people people had already figured out what it was I was trying to. Uh, uh, did you manage to solve that question by the way? Can we quickly look at the example so that maybe in case people don't understand, is that fine? Did you quickly? Right? I'll copy paste these things here. All right. And I need to copy these things here. Views. You know what? This is. As, as we are doing this, uh, as I'm doing this clearly, I hope we are, we are brooding about uh, some of these things we've been speaking about. More questions are welcome, please. Uh, so his, his question is, what if we, we created a function y that uh, that, let's say, creates, you want it to be a list, is it? Uh, the, the kind side here is saying that uh, what if we created uh, <coughs> uh, So let's just quickly try and see if this thing works, right? Uh, in syntax errors, right? And we all know why this is happening, is it? What are we returning here? Our oh, list, right? So his question is, what if we created this thing here, this function y, right? And, and seeing as we know that our, 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 our previous function, the first function x, takes in a variable list of parameters, what if we we did this instead, right? What if we did this instead? Would this work? That's his question, is it? And how do we evoke our function? Like that, right? And we don't know why this is not working. Why? Because we are returning, right? We, we don't, when we return a value, we're returning a data type. We're not printing out anything here, right? Yeah. 
this does not mean that the Jews are going to what are, what are we doing wrong here? Oh, it's why, is it? Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I was getting confused here. Uh, it's confusing when you're standing in front. Uh, so do we, do, we, do we now see that it's possible to do this? Can we, can we see what's happening here? And, and, and in case people are confused here, we are saying it's normally best practice for us to do what? To assign variables to these things. We know that the output that we're interested in is this, right? The evocation process is going on at line number 13. We are invo line number 13 is evoking function y. And what function y is doing is what? It's essentially just returning a list, a list of what? Five numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, right? Is this making sense? So it works. Okay. And again, obviously, this is supposed to be, as we said, FX and AVG. Is, is this okay? Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, something else that we, we need to remind ourselves is that, uh, so we just, like in real life, it's not really like we'll be implementing these things and then using the Python interpreter, uh, you know, to, to run things, you know. Obviously, what you want to do is you want to, to share this code that you've implemented with, with other individuals, right, out there. And the way that they get to use it is obviously if, you're, if you've implemented something as simple as what we've been doing, Look at the code snippet on the left-hand side here, to, to remind those of us who don't know what's going on here. If, if, if we share this code with somebody else, what they'll have to do is obviously, uh, you know, uh, they'll, they'll, well, the normal thing to do here is you'd obviously run this function, like uh, it could be as, as part of, well, so it, it could be that you'd evoke the function to get its output and then use it as input to something else. Or if it's a, a utility function that doesn't necessarily require you to obtain any useful output, what you'd otherwise do is you could just run it in the command line on the terminal, right? Right? So you can run this 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 dot py function as it is. But on the other hand, if you want, if let's say we had implemented this module, this is a module by the way, it, any dot py file is a module file, right? It's a module. If on the other hand we just wanted to to use it. Um, exactly the same way we use things like math dot square root, for instance. What we would do is we would, we would have to change directory into the location where the file is, right? And then within wing, make sure that the file in which we're implementing this function is in the same location as, as the module function. And then we could just as well easily issue the commands on the right-hand side, right? So we can, we can import the module, right? And we know about these different ways of importing modules because we have been reusing code. You know, there are other built-in functions that we've been using, right? I uh, remember the upper, well, not the upper function because it's a, it's a built-in function. It's already part of the scope that we use. Uh, but the, the math, the math package, or the yeah, the math package is a very classic example, right? We have uh, the square root function that we've been reusing. Um, there's a there's a dead package as well that you can use in case you haven't used it before, right? But so we know that line number one and line number five you know, make it possible for us to reuse code in this way, right? So what you're essentially doing when you're creating these modules and then, you know, including functions within these modules is you are making it possible for people to be able to reuse the code in the same way that you use the math package, right? If you implemented something very useful and I found it interesting, I would come to you and ask if we'd share your code free of charge, I would get it, and then I'll be able to use it like that, right? Just to remind ourselves about, about functions, and perhaps this will make a lot more sense now. Some examples of you know, some of the built-in functions that we've, we've, been, we've been using here. And just, just a quick poll here to try and see if people understand what's going on here. Do, do you, what, what is the result of, of uh, what would happen if we said y is equal to print hello? What's the return type there? What, what does the print function return? A string. 
I, I'm, I'm forced to do this because I, 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 people, people need to. I'm forced to do this because. Uh, Is this a string? The, what, what do you normally use the print function for, the built-in function for? You use it to spit out values. It, it does not return anything. It's, it's a classic example of the way that the, 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 previous, function, the, the previous functional definitions we've been, well, the, it's a classic example of how we've been previously doing these things before we introduced the return statement. Remember what we used to do, we just print out things. Uh, and and this, is, uh, this is really interesting because we used to print out things using the print function, the built-in function, right? So it returns nothing, right? Is it making, making sense now? What, what does len do? Well, what does len return? It's an int, right? It's, it returns just the length of something. It could be the length of the string. You know, it could be a length of a list, a length of the set of a tuple. You know, so it's an integer. What does input return? Yeah, it's a string. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping this makes sense now. And it should make sense because the reason we're doing this is once we start looking at uh, you know, subsequent topics, uh, once we get, we, we get into uh, data types, when we start looking at tuples and sets and dictionaries in more detail, what will happen is we will start using a lot of inbuilt functions uh, within those different classes, right? And the only way you get to understand what's happening is if you understand the implications of implementing a function, what happens when you implement a function, you know, what is the purpose of the return statement, right? And, and, and if you remember what we've done, what, what we've essentially done with functions is very few things, right? We've only introduced two reserved keywords, the def and the return statement, that's it. The, the only other syntax that is a part of what we've been doing with regards to function is what? Just the function signature, right? That's how simple functions are, right? The other funky you know, syntax things that we have, like uh, the quags um, or, or the, the single positional op operators, I mean, that's, that's easy stuff. You just have to remember that uh, a single asterisk makes it possible for you to feed a function with an unlimited number of arguments, 255 or so it seems. Uh, but when you have two asterisks, what it means is you need to feed it what? Keyweighted arguments, right? Name value pairs, a key and a value separated by an equal sign. Are we finally comfortable with functions? Can we proceed to testing now? Are there any questions? There's an exercise tomorrow, and uh, uh, you, you certainly need to understand these things before you attend the exercise. It's not going to be like the previous one. Um, so I hope you understand. OK. So this is, this is something really interesting, because uh, I think it's interesting because we've, we've been implicitly doing a number of things that we're going to talk about here, right? Uh, Things do go wrong when you're programming, as, 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 as with all things in life. Um, nothing is straightforward, right? And, and typically, when something goes wrong, um, I mean, the, the, the thing that goes wrong when you're programming is normally referred to as an error, right? Um, well, the other funky names that I use, such as bugs, right? Um, but then, thankfully enough, there's, there's a way in which we can we can go about uh, providing or so resolving those problems that would otherwise uh, find ourselves in when we are programming, right? So there's, there's a number of different errors. And, and I think the, the first one that we should probably speak about here is syntax errors, right? Because we've, this is perhaps you know, one of those errors that we've consistently encountered as we are programming, right? Uh, and the, the, the giveaway thing with syntax errors is when, when you run a, uh, a code snippet within the Python interpreter or within Wing, what Wing will typically do is it will, it will explicitly tell you whether or not something is a syntax error, right? right? And I, I've, I've always thought that syntax errors are the easiest to resolve because the only thing you have to do for you to avoid syntax errors is follow the rules, people. And following rules is perhaps one of those 
you know, uh, one of those probably easiest things that we we'll ever do in life, right? If somebody says, uh, you know, uh, for you to to be able to pass the exam, you must study and practice. I mean, if you don't follow those rules, then you know you will fail. But if you follow the rules, you know that you will pass, right? So all you have to do to avoid syntax errors is conform, right? And of course, you don't have to memorize things. We know that we have access to the documentation, right? Um, there's a classic example here of a syntax error. We know that one of the rules is that a variable name can never start with a number. And so the moment you, you even attempt to execute it, the Python interpreter will tell you to say that's an error. Right? Okay. And then there's runtime errors, right? So these, these are things, so these are errors or issues that will otherwise arise after you've already executed a program, right? So you could, you could be defining a function, let's say a function that adds two numbers, right? You implement it um, and then it so happens that you're not, you know, uh, explicitly uh, handling those errors using exceptions, which we'll get to learn about with Dr. De uh, if, if you attempt to add a number and, and a string by evoking your add function, you get into a runtime error. But at that, po at, at that point, Python would have already passed your program, you know, and certified it fit, syntactically at least, for you to be able to evoke, right? So it's up to you to be able to, to, to sort of like find workarounds for, for overcoming runtime errors. And the way that we do that is we, we obviously use exceptions. So it's, it's somewhat slightly easier to, to, hunt, to hunt down runtime errors provided that you understand the domain within which you are programming in. So as an example, if you are performing, uh, more, let's say, uh, a, a file input output operation, uh, you know that the potential problems that could occur if you are processing files is, number one, it could be that uh, the file might not exist, right? So what, what, what you'd want to avoid is a sort of situation where when a use, a potential use of your program runs that file and encounters that problem, you don't want them to, you know, to, to be in a position where they won't be able to determine exactly what is going, what, what, is, what, what has gone wrong. And so what you do is you handle such exceptions, right? And the way that you handle these sort of exceptions is by using um, uh, um, there's this syntax that we'll get to learn about. You use the try and um, accept block to do that, right? So if we were, we were say, uh, trying to come up with an implementation of a function that divides two numbers, we know that the potential runtime errors that could go wrong is dividing a number, an integer by zero, right? And, and you can try, try this out in the interpreter if you want to. Uh, one divided by zero is an error, right? Another runtime error that we've come across is adding a string with a number. It's a type error. So you handle these things by using exceptions. Pretty easy and straightforward. The only syntax that you ever learn when you do this with Dr. Derains is um, understanding what happens when you use the try and accept blocks. All right. Doing this time here. And then there's logical errors, right? This, this is a tough one here, and, and this is probably not really a tough one. It's, it's, it's not that hard provided that you, you appropriately test you know, the code before you distribute it to people, potential users, right? right? So logical errors are essentially arise, or you don't, you don't really, it's, it's actually really hard for you to notice them unless if you, you test for all potential input values that you'd be feeding into your code construct, right? Uh, as an example, I think we, we ran into a logical error when the lady uh, was walking us through an implementation of our add function. You remember we, we defined our sum variable within the looping construct, and what it was doing, it was, it was overriding the value every time we were looping through it, right? And so when we tried to add one, two, and three, we were getting the result three instead of getting six, right? For the very simple reason that the summation variable was defined within the loop construct. And all we had to do to resolve that logical error was what? Move the statement outside of the loop block, right? 
Logical errors, this is an MCG, are all about reasoning, right? So if, if you are tired, if it so happens that you are tired when you are you know, programming, then you could potentially run into those uh, problems, right? A quick exercise here. Seeing as we've looked at the three potential logical errors, and this is serious, we want people, people to understand what's, what's going on here. From line number one to seven here, can we, are, are we able to notice any potential errors? And if we are, yeah, what, oh, there's already an answer here. Sorry? Because it's coming off the return. Thank you for that. So that's one. Uh, if we're assuming that uh, as a programmer, as me, I wanted the output to be printed out, it certainly won't be printed out because we know that the, the moment Python comes across a return statement, that's it. It, it, will, it will return, I mean, it, it, will, it will actually return away from a function definition and won't proceed and execute any of the statements that occur afterwards. So that's one of them, yes? There's no kind of results. The return is designed to anything. Out. Yeah, but 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 uh, so, so that's the thing, right? Did you hear what he just said? He's saying uh, I need us to understand. He's saying uh, the function doesn't it doesn't print out anything. A assuming that my I just mean, assuming that my our implementation in our implementation we wanted the function to print out something and it doesn't, then we'd say it was a logical error, right? Uh, but technically speaking. Yeah, but I mean, if we, we take into account that we wanted to print something, yes, that would be a logical error, right? Yes. Um, you thought by it, you can, um, it will work, but it won't add the numbers together because those are strings. It will just print one and one, two. Ah. Uh, can, can we quickly, and, and I know we're trying to move away from this type of thing here, but we need to, to, to look at what's, what's happening here. Uh, uh, and this is very important because people, people need to understand what's going on here, right? Come on, Excel. Um, yeah. What am I doing? Okay. I just want to, to show you that it's actually going to work, right? And if you could, you could tell the, the entire class, uh, if, we, if we could tell the, the class, uh, <laughs> syntax errors here, right, clearly. <clears throat> If we, could, if we could tell the entire class as we're answering the question what, what sort of error it is, whether it's a syntax error, a runtime error, or a logical error, that would really help. We were, trying, we were trying to understand here, right? So you notice that it, it actually runs just fine. So it's, it's actually going to work, right? As, sorry? Oh, there was there. OK, th then if it was the string. Oh, yeah, yeah thank you. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see this. I'm, I could be tired here. Yeah, I probably need my glasses or something. Um, so line number five, yes? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. It, it is, sorry? It, 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 is, it is a logical error. It's actually right. Because if we run, if we run our function with, with strings, look at this. What, what would be the result here, people? One, two, a string one, two, right? And this is a logical error because what we're trying to do is we'd be trying to add, if I was a user, I'd be trying to say, I want to add one and two, but instead of feeding it uh, numbers, actual numbers, integers or floating point numbers, I'm feeding it what strings. And so we're getting, so this is a logical error. Thank you, classic example of a logical error here. What other errors, people? Yes? Thank you, so two things. We are feeding it one argument. And, and, and the thing here is, uh, if, if we run this function with one argument, what sort of, what, what sort of error is it? What, what, you mentioned two things. What errors are those? Uh, I would say it's a logical error. Do you think it's a logical error? Sorry? We have syntax errors, runtime errors, and logical errors, right? 
So she's saying that line number, line number six is number one. It's, it's, it's taking in one argument, right? What, what's, what's the other reason? It's a, uh, no, not only is it not a number, but we know that the plus sign is a binary operator. It's not an binary operator. It can't, it can't exist on its own, right? It needs two operands against it. So the first error, the first error is that, uh, let's start with feeding it one parameter here, right? One. Runtime error. So your first, you first mentioned the runtime error. We're feeding it one argument, it's a runtime error, right? And then if we feed it the plus, it's a syntax error because we know that, uh, and, and we can see this, we, we, we know it's a syntax error because we can see it spitting out what it is here, right? There's no magic. So we, we know that this is a syntax error because the plus is a binary operator, it's not an binary, it can't exist on its own, yeah. Oh, I, I, I honestly can't quite think of a, a potential point exception in, in Python. I, I can't here. Yeah. I can't. I can't think of an, an array out of bounds equivalent exception, but I, I'm trying to think if we can, we can come up with an example that could print out a null point exception. Uh, I don't know. Um, when, when you want to print a variable, no, that's not a null point exception. Uh, it's, it should be a, a, a name error of some sort. So if we if we just do that, it's a name error. You notice that, right? So A doesn't exist in our scope in my current scope here. So it's just a name error. This is a runtime error, by the way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other? Any other errors we can spot here? But line number seven, is it not an, uh, an error? What type of error is line number seven? No one mentioned line number seven. What type of an error is it? Runtime error, yeah. Okay. Um, so the thing is, as, as, uh, as, as to wrap up here, um, so I, I came across an interesting article not so long ago. Apparently there's this guy, he's a security expert, right? And he, he won uh, $5,000 in form of a Google bounty. What, what he did was he figured out a way in which he could literally delete any YouTube video on YouTube, right? I have a YouTube channel, by the way. So if he went to my site to go and uh, to delete my videos, I, I don't know why he would want to delete my videos. Um, he figured out a way to do that, right? What sort of an error is that? It's a logic error. So there was a, there was a, logi a logical error within the code that runs YouTube somewhere, but they fixed it. All right. So these are, these are the things that we want to think about as we, you know, progress. And uh, tomorrow, obviously, we are going to we are wrapping up here. Tomorrow, we are going to what we're going to do is we are we are going to well, day after tomorrow. Tomorrow, we day after tomorrow, we are going to look at how how we can use um, Wing to actually debug our code. Right? We're trying to understand how debugging works. And then on, on Thursday, we'll wrap up uh, testing in general. We'll look at equivalence testing. Unless if there are any questions here. Is this making sense? It's going to be a lab exercise tomorrow, and it's, it's not going to be, we don't want it to be easy, because for the purposes of what's coming next, not just Monday, but also for the purposes of uh, what we start doing on Tuesday, uh, Thursday, and the other Monday, right? When we start looking at data structures. We want to make sure that we understand functions, and so um, it's, yeah. Are we, are we cool now? Do we understand functions? Okay, thank you, great.